السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أهلا وسهلا بجميع إدارة الشؤون الأكاديمية والتدريب بصحة الطائف ترحب بالجميع اليوم في ورشة العمل بالتعاون مع إدارة المستشفيات طبعا عنوان ورشة العمل تدبير وتحويل الحالات الحرجة Management and Transfer to Critical and Emergency Cases حيكون معنا الدكتور عبد الله الحارثي واستشار عناية مركزة رئيس قسم العناية المركزة مستشفى الملك عبد العزيز التخصصي وحيكون معنا الدكتور عبد المنعم سعيد محمد الفكي استشاري طوارئ بمستشفى الملك عبد العزيز التخصصي مدير برنامج تخصص طب الطوارئ بمستشفى الملك عبد العزيز التخصصي بداية حنبدا مع الدكتور عبد الله دكتور عبد الله المايك عندك تفضل السلام عليكم. عليكم السلام تفضل حبيبي السلام عليكم, عليكم. وعليكم. صباح الخير الله يعطيكم العافيه اجمعين يا رب طيب استاذ طارق بخصوص الحضور كاني شايف ان الحضور لسه يعني ما في الا خمسه ايش رايك لو ناخر شويه؟ لا المحاضره حتكون مسجله وحتنزل في المنصه اليوم دونت وري باور طيب تمام الله يعطيكم العافيه طيب انا حامل دحين شير سكرين لل اكزاكتلي exactly. الكونتنت اللي عندك نعم تفضل اوكي نايس بسم الله طيب دقيقه واحده استاذ طارق واضحة؟ ايه واضحة اعمل انيبل ايديتنج وبعدين نخش على طبعا انا عارف ايش اللي عندي دقيقة واحدة اوكي تيك يور تايم ار ريبيت ات اجين يا نو وريز نو وريز يو كان ستارت اوكي السلام عليكم صباح الخير اسمي عبد الله انا كونسلتنت اي سي يو هيد اوف كريتيكال كير ميديسن ريجيونال كريتيكال كير سوبرفايزر تايف افير سو توداي وي غانا توك اباوت ذا ريفيرال ان اي سي يو ترانسبورتيشن مانجمنت ان فور ذا كريتيكال ال بيشنت اي نو اتس ان ديفيكالت تو هاندل ان كريتيكال ال بيشنت in a limited sources area, especially in the peripheral hospital. And uh, I will try to highlight the important point, and I will try to discuss the important issues regarding management, transportation, etc. So my objective, it will be referral to ICU, and when my patient need ICU, how I involved ICU team, what are the indication for ICU admission or the criteria for ICU admission, how I can transport a critically ill patient. So in the beginning, I will speak about the referral to ICU and when my patient need an ICU. We know that the ICU, how is it composed? Usually ICU. ICU room, it's containing an advanced monitoring for the patient and uh, having an uh, monitoring either by human sources like the nurses or the machines, also being supported within the, 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 the organ support machines like the ventilators, infusion pumps, etc. So the main goal in the ICU, usually, it's the organ support plus monitoring for the patient. I will just make it easy. When you call ICU to handle and deal with your case, when you ask ICU help, either in the ER or in the ward, both of it's it's considered as a critical situation. The most common things is like threatened airway. Threatened airway, it means the patient lose the ability 
to protect his airway or there is an airway problem like strider obstruction or respiratory arrest the patient cannot breathe respiratory rate more than 40 less than 8 oxygen saturation low or cardiac arrest when you announce code blue pulse rate when it's so uh, bradycardic or tachycardic systolic blood pressure less than 90 when your patient become hypotensive and also when your patient developed an alternation conscious level or fall in the Glasgow coma scale more than two repeated or prolonged seizure seizure it's one of the indication to call ICU when it's difficult to control Rising arterial carbon dioxide tension, it's mere retention CO2. When your patient starts to retain CO2 and he needs like non-invasive ventilation to help him to take out this PCO2, or when your patient developed an CO2 toxicity due to medication like opioid overdose. Any patient giving a, a, a case for concern, also, when you have a concern about your patient, like your patient is hemodynamically unstable, understated, you will call the ICU to seek the information and the further management for your patient. So an admission in the ICU usually, when we admit a patient to ICU, I try to make it simple and easy. When, you, when the patient requires advanced respiratory support, Usually, the advanced respiratory support is a mechanical ventilation. Either it will be through the non-invasive or invasive. Or when there is possibility of loose or compromised airway. So when you monitor your patient. As well, for the respiratory monitoring, when the patient need more than like the liter oxygen, possibility to progress when the patient having like an, a thick secretion or a lot of secretion need to be handled and suction, chest physiotherapy in case of lung collapse or atelectasis, or when the patient recently to be extubated. Also as well, for circulatory support, usually the patient will go for ICU to receive the vasoactive drugs, which help to maintain the blood pressure of the patient. Also as well, there is another uh, type of circulatory support rather than the chemical support like the mechanical intraortic balloon pump and other devices. So also as well, we will go for neurological monitoring and support when the patient have an, a depressed conscious level or when the patient start to develop an uh, alternation conscious level. The patient who have been in a risk to progressive, to lose conscious and become stuporous or need an uh, organ support. And as well in the end, the renal, renal support on the patient within like an acute renal shutdown, need dialysis for the first time, accesses this stuff. So factor to be considered when you're assessing suitability for admission to intensive care. So this is the factor most common be used when you send the patient to the ICU. The diagnosis for the patient and severity of the illness, the age, the comorbid, physiological reserve, prognosis, availability of the suitable treatment, response to treatment to that, recent cardiopulmonary arrest, anticipated quality, of life. My important talk, it will be about transportation of the critically ill patient. And when I should to transport a patient from the peripheral hospital to a uh, central hospital for receiving a care and providing an advanced measure. Also through this talk, I will try to go through the simple measures of resuscitation or management for the case. I'm, I will thank Dr. In advance, Dr. Abdelmanim in advance. He will speak about the resuscitation in the ER and how to 
manage and handle the critically patient. So inter-hospital transport usually is a secondary transport when you transport a patient between two separate hospitals. It's a provide for equivalent or a higher degree of monitoring and medical care. Usually, when you transport a patient from a hospital to hospital, the idea here to be safe, ride, and trip for the patient. Usually, when we transport the patients, either for diagnostic technology not available in the primary hospital or the first hospital, procedure and interventions not available, the expertise, the specialties, it's important when we like sending a patient to be seen by the cardiologist because there is no cardiologist in the primary hospital. And also the request of the family and the patient. So, stabilization of the critically ill patient before, during, and after transportation is the cornerstone and the main mandatory work of the medical team. Systemic ap uh, approach to ensure safety of the transportation is very crucial and important in these cases. Assessment and management of the patient during transportation focus primary on the APCDE. So this is our an, uh, uh, like an uh, a comprehensive way to manage the patient and keep following your patient. So in the airway with a cervical spine control, this is A. After the patient being stabilized in the ER and you are trying to push the patient or shift the patient according to the needs to ICU as we discussed early, when the patient need ICU for organ support or advanced monitoring. Now, most of our peripheral hospital containing an anesthesia doctors inside, they are working there, thanks for them. So if you have any concern regarding the airway, you can contact the anesthesia doctor. If you are not qualified to do an airway management like intubation, advanced using of, of airway, you can call the uh, anesthesia and he, he, he will help you to secure the airway of the patient. The patient transport association would increase risk of displacement of an artificial airway. The current status of the airway should to be assessed. Physical examination include location and security of any airway. This X-ray can conform endotracheal tube placement of an endotracheal tube during transportation can be successfully by transport personnel. It's important to secure the airway prior to transport in patient that may be present significant challenge for airway management. The main, con the main concern here, it's about early securing of the airway before transportation of the patient because the risk of losing the airway during the transportation. As well, most of the patient, they will require an cervical spine control, especially the trauma patient and those, those patients like growth comatose. We don't know the story of the patient. We have to protect the cervical spine. After the A, the airway, we will go for breathing with effective oxygenation and ventilation. Respiratory compromise associated with transport may include hypoxia, hypercapnia, smear retention of the CO2, with respiratory acidosis and hyperventilation with alkalosis. Hypoxemia during transportation is more likely when the patient requires a higher FiO2 or a high P period to transportation when the patient requires a high support of mechanical ventilation. It will be difficult to transport the patient when he requires like an FiO200 with a PEEP of 
14 or 15 the transportation of the patient will be difficult maybe it will be unsafe for him because losing beep will lead to de-recruit the lung and it will become more difficult to oxygenate the patient also consumption of the oxygen FiO 200 the flow on the ventilator it will be consume the gas on the transportation very fast so the mandatory here before transport your patient you will look to the respiratory rate level of FiO2 or oxygen requirement and recent chest x-ray like if your patient requiring a uh, low support of an uh, oxygen like uh, 10 liters of oxygen or 5 liters of oxygen with a uh, respiratory rate of 30s and his x-ray is being good there is no pathological uh, problem need to be managed right now like an pneumothorax that's time the patient you can transport him but if the patient have something to be managed like a pneumothorax and the x-ray as we mentioned or on a very high requirement he's in non-rebreathing face mask and the patient he's breathing like in a, in a fourth is his respiratory rate so it's better to support his respiration before shifting the patient it's better to intubate the patient to make the trip safe as possible for the patient circulation and hemodynamic stability so as we mentioned before a for airway p for breathing c for the circulation according to all the studies in the world there is nothing can no definitive study has demonstrated which patient will demonstrate hemodynamic instability during transportation. It means nobody can predict any patient who will be compromised on the studies. But you are a doctor and you know that your patient need an ICU. So you have to take all the precaution and the measures before shifting your patient through a long right trip like if we compare another uh, our peripheral hosp uh, hospital from the central hospital from peripheral hospital they are far away from the central hospital up to 380 kilometer so the ride is around four hours it will be quite difficult to predict what will happen in the next four hours for the patient so how we will do on a circulatory and hemodynamic support for the patient usually to assess his general status and prepare what we need during transportation from the pharmacological medication and infusion like norepinephrine giving and start policies of fluid using the non-invasive monitoring for the blood pressure during keeping to reading the blood pressure during the transportation, attach the leads of the ECG to see that if there is any risk of arrhythmias or dysarrhythmia during the transportation. It's a quite challenging to maintain the patient all the time of transportation but it will be and safe for the patient if it's been monitored well and resuscitated well before shifting. So debility is a neurological status. Factor considered within the disability of the neurological status along with the sedation and pain control, hypercapnic, hypocapnia, hypoxemia, what is the neurological outcome associated with increased like traumatic brain injury and increased ICB? So excessive spinal movement may be exacerbate cervical spine injury. Excessive sedation may be impair ability to provide ongoing patient assessment while lack of sedation can result in release of the stress and hormones. This is done a very good during a uh, transportation of the patient regarding also using the sedation 
if you give the patient a very big dose of sedation, when you catch to other hospital, it will be very difficult to awake the patient and assess his neurological status. And during transportation, if the patient didn't be sedated, he will develop the ana stress. Might to be ended within the like cardiac insult, like Takatsubo heart disease, stress induced cardiomyopathy, or ana induced harm for the patient, like he will remove the tubes or remove the lines. Exposure in environment and equipment. It can be easy that's the changing on the environment of the patient during transportation. The patient will be transported from a hospital to another hospital. So changing on the temperatures of the room, the fluid, the medication, maybe induced hypothermia for the patient. So monitoring of the temperature is very important during transportation from a city or from a hospital to another hospital. As we mentioned before, securing airway is very important. Hair displacement of the monitoring and also therapeutic devices may be to be habit. And also displacement of the airway might to be happy. So we have to be pay attention to our patient. And also, it's very crucial to monitor your patient during the trip. Lifting of the patient by health worker provider is treated with impact injury and the high percent of nurses leave the profession due to such a problems. It's mean that sometime on the medical work, med health, health worker during the work, they could do an excessive job beyond their limits and might lead also to injury to the medical team. In a critically ill patient, at least should to be monitored with an ECG during transportation from a hospital to another hospital. Utilize of the transport implants, it's very important. Also many factors, it can be crucial to pay attention for, like the monitoring inside the implants, the durability, the visibility of the alarm and the batteries, infusions device and also the availability of the ECG and another stuff. The, mid, the, the, the cornerstone on all of this process is the communication, safety and quality during shifting an a patient or transporting a patient. Communication of complete accurate information is critical to save patient transfer. It's mean when I'm sending a patient from peripheral, a hospital far away from the city by 200 kilometer, it's very important to tell them accurate data about my patient, to prepare themselves to receive the patient, and also to provide the best treatment for the patient. Availability of the sources on the receiving hospital is a variant. It's a, it can be affected within the number of the patient in that hospital. So when you give an, a clear data, your patient will be safe and will take the best measures. Like when you send a patient and you tell them this patient is a critical, but you didn't mention the patient, he's in invasive ventilation. They will receive him in the ER without a preparation for ventilated patient. And also very crucial, that's between nurse to nurse, doctor to doctor endorsement, 
continuity of the plan and copies of medical record and also the flow charts of the patients. I will go through now on a take home message that our Ministry of Health provide an services of an urgent consultation and help regarding critically ill patient on 1937. It's a 24 hour available to support a diagnose and to facilitate the management for all the critically ill patients. Early recognition of unstable patient will help to prevent poor outcome. Safety is the main key before, during, and after transportation. Before I end my talk, I will just review the points for ICU admission again before the criteria for calling intensive care staff to adult patient again and again. And that's why my your patient needing an ICU when he have airway problem, severe respiratory compromise, post cardiac arrest, severe bradycardia or tachycardia or severe arrhythmias, systolic blood pressure less than 90, alternation conscious level, repeated or prolonged seizures, respiratory failure type 2, or what they call it, an retention of the CO2 level. Again, when the patient will be eligible to, to ICU, and how the patient will be assessed for ICU, it's a constant it's, it's, it's a picture of comprehensive uh, data from the history and the physical examination for the patient to go to the ICU. Like sometime you'll see in a, in a patient, he, he's, he, he looks stable in the ER, but he needs an ICU because this patient, let's suppose an example, he's in a, a paracetamol toxicity acetaminophen toxicity presented to the ER with raised liver enzymes and uh, uh, decreased urine output. So this patient, when you look at him in the ER, he's a quite stable. He didn't require any organ support this moment, but this patient, he require continuous monitoring and special measures like special medication for paracetamol toxicity also require following of his liver function test requiring and a monitoring for his uh, renal function test etc so it's a case dependent and it's sometimes depending on the patient needs but as usual, we will keep the two concerns for patient need and a continuous advanced monitoring, patient need and an organ support. Thank you a lot. I will uh, leave the stage for Dr. Abdel Menaim to help us, inshallah, and educate us about the managing the critically ill patient. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Please stay with us uh, until the uh, Dr. Abdelmanish uh, is going to finish. After that, we're going to do uh, a discussion with the uh, all attendants. Uh, Dr. Abdelmanish, please share your screen. Dr. Abdelmanish, did you hear me? Dr. Abdelmanish? Yes, you can start. Okay. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, me is Dr. Abdul Munaim Saeed Muhammad. I'm uh, ER consultant at King Abdul Aziz Hospital, which means that I receive most of your referral to King Abdul Aziz Hospital. 
because all referral to King Abdulaziz Hospital pass through the ER. And this is a very important topics that we are discussing today uh, because it have a great impact on the patient health and the family. And also it has impacts on us. Uh, thank Dr. Abdullah for the elaborated uh, presentation on the patient assessment and patient transfer and what we need to transfer. Uh, when we need what we need to uh, when we need to transfer one patient from one hospital to another so let us uh, discuss uh, first what is uh, inter hospital transfer the inter hospital transfer by definition is uh, uh, moving one patient physically from one hospital to another hospital this means patient already in one hospital and for one or other reason, he need to go to other hospital. So it includes any transfer after initial assessment and stabilization from that uh, health facility to another hospital. And that's to say, this is not like the pre-hospital care and transport. What is the difference? The difference is you cannot shift the patient without uh, discussing the risk and benefits from uh, transfer for transferring of this patient to other facility. It scope and run is not the essence in the uh, interhospital transfer. You cannot move unstable patients who are at risk, like in the pre-hospital. In pre-hospital, you can take the patient to the nearest facility to get medical attention but for inter-hospital transfer it should have assessment stabilization and reason for transport what does that mean it means this is a specialized service this is a specialized service to transport patient from one hospital to others why because the care is not available in the referring hospital it is a patient centered patient conferences on this process it should provide a safe experience access to specific medical care services and personnel. The patient is the center of the hospital transfer. I cannot provide the service for this patient in my hospital. So the patient tries to get the best medical care available in the region, which is provided by the Ministry of Health and Directorate of uh, Health in Thais. And also it addresses the family. Uh, there is a family concern regarding uh, providing of free assurance that the patient or their relatives will get uh, the best experience and the specialty of care. <clears throat> what is the goals or objectives? As we mentioned earlier, it is a unique uh, patient needs is important. The patient is fairest. Uh, so hospital transfer means the uniqueness of the ill and injured patient. It recognizes different levels and types of care that the patient needs also it uh, <clears throat> it satisfies the needs of the medical community one hospital in the periphery of type unable to provide the help needed for the patient so he will coordinate with the uh, the regional hospitals the highest center in the region uh, so by this means it extends the specialized care to the community more distant location. Some patient in Rania will get the best care available when we use the hospital transfer in the right way. And it also allow for efficient and cost effective regionalization of medical expertise. Some, uh, some uh, specialties, it cannot be provided everywhere. So it will be in one center and patient can be transferred as soon as possible. So the aim and the goal of the inter-hospital transfer is to provide a high quality of care at the moment of call and deliver the patient safely to the receiving center, uh, where I mean uh, the definitive care area in a stable and improved condition. <clears throat> okay, decision to transfer. 
This one is centered around the optimal health and well-being of the patient. As we mentioned earlier, the patient is first in hospital transfer. And the decision to transfer should include and determine the risk that it might occur to the patient when we took him from one facility to other facilities. And what is the benefits? And is the benefits outweigh the risk? If the benefits does not overweigh the risk, then no need to transfer the patient. This also governed by the hospital policies, protocols, and staff education and training, uh, physical direction, and a written transfer agreement. This is a very important for the safe patient transport. So the decision of transfer depends on the policies of the Ministry of Health and the uh, Directorate of Health, and also what the benefit, what the, the patient can benefit from the transport. <clears throat> so, what is the indication for transport? The main indicator is the surface or the resources of the hospital cannot meet the needs of the patient. The surface and resources is not available at the referring hospital in order to provide adequate level of patient care and experience. For example, one patient with head injury and the center does not have a CT facility. This patient should be transferred if the doctors suspect this patient might have intracranial hemorrhage because the resources is not available in the center. And this patient can deteriorate if he did not get the surface and the proper treatment at the proper time. Other example, one patient from one peripheral hospital which presented to the hospital with abdominal pain and they don't have a CT uh, scan in the center. The CT scan was moved from the center to another for one or other reason. So this patient was suffered in the transport and the end of this is a complaint of the family because their relative does not get the ultimate care uh, suspected from us. Other specific reason include there is no subspecialty coverage. Neurosurgery, for example, transplantation, cardiac, uh, PCI, all this necessitate you to decide to send the patient to uh, a higher facility. And lack of required level of medical care, such as intensive care. Uh, some uh, hospital does not have intensivists in their facilities. And also lack of equipment, equipment necessary to provide acceptable standard of care, such as we mentioned imaging and interventional capabilities. What is important when I want to transfer one patient is the communication. Communication with the family and the patient himself and communication with the receiving hospital. Uh, you, you have to communicate with the patient and give a detailed discussion with the patient regarding the clinical status of the patient, his needs, and why you want to transfer this patient to other hospital. Some may not understand why you are taking my father or my mother or my brother so far where I cannot have a good accommodation. I cannot follow my relative properly, but you need to give him the facts, the real facts regarding the clinical status of the patient and the reason why you are transferring him. And it is very important also to get the consent consent after the discussion and after you explain the risk that it could happen if the patient is stay in your hospital and also the benefit he might get when he transfers to the other hospital. In addition to the risk that might occur and happen to the patient while he is in a journey to the uh, receiving hospital. <clears throat> and also communicating between the referring and receiving physicians. This is most of the time is not there. Most of the time we don't have a good communication. Referral hospital try to send the patient because of many reasons and they will not have a good and proper communication with the receiving hospital and what exactly the service that they want uh, to be provided for the patient. And this 
part is the cause of many, many problems that happen to the patient during their transport and also the doctors because of the legal suits that rise when improper communication occurs. And the family senses that their relatives or the patient sense he is not uh, served the way he should. First of all, you need to discuss the clinical condition of the patient and treatment with the receiving doctors and with the receiving facility. This is very important. And why are you sending this patient to him? What is the reason that you send the reason? And what is the mode of transport and the approximate timeline of the transfer? Sometimes we get uh, a notification that patient will be sent to our ER and we wait the whole shift and patient is not coming. And the one on the shift leave, the other who did not receive the call, he will be in the shift and then he will be surprised that some patient is coming and he don't know exactly what he can do for this patient, which can cause delay in the definitive care needed in the fairest place. And all evidence <coughs> shows that lack of communication, communication breakdown, jeopardize the patient's safety during hospital transport. What you need, you can use the supper communication mnemonic, which include you give idea to the receiving doctors about the situation. You describe the current situation of the patient in a clear, succinct overview of present issues. What is the issues regarding uh, the patient condition at your hospital? And briefly state what is the background history of the patient that can also add to the uh, <coughs> clinical situation. Also, what is your assessment regarding the physical examination? If there, uh, what is the investigation you already did? And this one you need to give uh, also a copy of it when you are sending the patient. And what is your recommendation? What you need exactly from the receiving doctors to do for this patient that you cannot do in your hospital or in your facility? Proper communication can serve the patient the best. Can serve the patient the best. Might be the service you are requesting is not available in the hospital you are communicating with. And then the patient will have further delay after getting to the uh, receiving hospital because they need to rearrange a transfer of the patient to other facility. <coughs> Triage of the patient for transfer. You need to determine what level of the situation of your patient. Uh, also triage for uh, transfer, it can be done through the operation, the call center in Taif, uh, who will arrange which patient goes where and when. <clears throat> the fairest and the most urgent is immediate patient who have a life-threatening condition or a disease. <clears throat> the patient condition is serious enough or the patient is deteriorating so rapidly and there is a potential of threat to life and organ uh, system failure, such as patient with ST elevation MI. This patient, if did not get as soon as possible to a cardiac cath, he may have impact on his cardiovascular system that will increase the burden on the whole health system from the morbidity that can occur and it might get into a mortality of the patient and losing him himself. So this kind of patient you need to send as soon as possible to the uh, a hospital where a care can be provided to such a patient.
For example, in King Abdul Aziz, there is a PCI facility, and in King Faisal, there is no uh, a PCI facility. So you cannot send this patient to King Faisal Hospital, but you have to send the patient to King Abdul Aziz Hospital. Even the direction or the policy, my mandate, the patient goes to King Faisal Hospital. Also, if a neurosurgery consultant is not present in the uh, King, uh, in one of these hospitals, and the other hospital having the, uh, the specialty care at that moment of time. So you cannot send the patient on the policies only, but you have to optimize the benefit of the patient from the transfer. Otherwise, there's no use to transfer this patient. <clears throat> so immediate patient request, immediate transfer, and include all patient that needs a life saving procedure or organ or limb procedures and time is essence in this kind of patient. The second category is the emergency category and this have a condition that pose life or limb threatening and the patient condition may progress to life or a limb threatening. Uh, they may need uh, to significantly, they may lead to a significantly morbid or adverse events depending on the transfer uh, occurring time. This patient should get to the destination hospital within four to six hours, not more than that. So they can be served properly. The time is critical for this patient. The third category is a patient with, uh, <clears throat> with condition that local staff and facility and equipment can safely maintain care for the patient with or without additional medical advice for a period not greater than 24 hours. Uh, the difference between urgent and emergent is that this urgent patient, their deterioration is dire, but there is a moderate risk that they can go into that uh, complication. Patient <coughs> who is hypotensive and uh, responding to fluid resuscitation with abdominal injury is an emergent case. He needs to go as soon as possible because he is stable at the moment, but the patient might need uh, more services. He might can deteriorate faster and need life saving. So this patient deterioration is high. This patient is emergent and as soon as possible within four to six hours, you need to get the patient to uh, a definitive care facility. While patient with, uh, for example, one patient came to King Abdul Aziz hospital, this patient was kicked by a horse. And this uh, trauma led to minimal intra-abdominal bleed. So this patient with available hospital resources, they can observe him for 24 to 48 hours, to 24 hours uh, without uh, expected deterioration. But deterioration, it could happen and patient might need further uh, management. This is an urgent kind of type uh, of patient. Other patients include like uh, patient with uh, cholecystitis. Uh, they can uh, be started on antibiotic and they, they get the uh, transport uh, arranged properly with the uh, <coughs> definitive uh, care facility uh, involving the surgeon in the plan of management and transfer the patient when the patient is stable and in improved condition. Uh, this patient can get into the hospital within 24 hours of arrival to destination. Uh, Semi-urgent patient, uh, potentially serious, where the patient condition might deteriorate if transfer does not occur within 24 to 38 hours. Uh, and uh, when the local uh, staff facility and equipment are able to save care for the patient with or without ongoing medical advice. This kind of patient uh, can wait, can get the treatment in the facility while also preparing, but it's not like the urgent case, it's less urgent. Uh, for example, patient with appendicitis, uh, 
This patient usually they do well. The risk for deterioration is low, but it's still patient if they don't get uh, ICU facilities, if the patient deteriorates during surgery or uh, patient is not improving or get deteriorated. This patient is a semi-urgent condition and it can go to the uh, definitive care facilities. Non-urgent patient, uh, when the patient condition is chronic or minor enough, that the symptoms or clinical outcome will be significantly affected if transfer does not occur for more than 30 hours. Uh, such a patient is a patient for cleaning for outpatient. Some patients with fractures who are stable and the uh, fracture does not uh, pose any threat uh, to the neurovascular bundle. Uh, they can be transferred when uh, <clears throat> when the surface to be provided for them is ready. Okay. This table summarizes uh, what we mentioned regarding the triage of the patient. So when you are triaging a patient, you need to look to the condition of the patient, what is the diagnosis, and anticipate whether the patient is going for further deterioration or not. And this should uh, have impact on your decision to transfer the patient or not. Okay. <clears throat> As we mentioned, you need to assess, stabilize the patient before uh, you send the patient. It aims to deliver the patient safely to receiving hospitals uh, for the definitive care and address the need for transfer and get a solid transfer reason. You assess the ABCD of the patient and determine the risk for deterioration and management accordingly. Uh, Dr. Abdullah has mentioned uh, clearly about the condition of the patient. You decide whether the patient is critical and he needs support during transport or not, starting from assessing the airway of the patient, the whether the airway is intact or not. This is one important. Does the patient need advanced airway before uh, transport? Uh, very important. Uh, if the patient presented to your hospital with a GCS of eight or below, you cannot send this patient without addressing the uh, advanced airway and inserting uh, endotracheal tube. A patient presented to you with uh, trauma and then his level of consciousness deteriorated from 14 to 12 and 11. Uh, it still is not uh, indication for intubation, but the patient already GC his level of consciousness is deteriorated. So this patient need his airway to be addressed before transport and it's better for this patient to be transported after uh, <coughs> airway uh, management. What is the vital signs of the patient regarding the blood pressure and the uh, heart rate? and the shock status. Uh, if the patient is shocked, you need to uh, stabilize the shock uh, before you send the patient. Uh, you give IV fluid, you give uh, inotropic support to the patient, uh, and then uh, you uh, address uh, the uh, <clears throat> his breathing. Uh, what is the heart respiratory rate of the patient? What is his SpO2? Is the patient safe to go with oxygen only? Or he needs uh, to address the airway and intubate the patient because of the breathing difficulties of the patient. And uh, uh, then you address the uh, neurological disabilities of the patient. Uh, does the patient need uh, further support to his... Uh, Heart, for example, uh, is the patient got arrhythmia? Uh, patient is stable enough to be sent without uh, giving any medication? What medication you need to prepare for the patient? And the environment during transport, is it a safe environment? What team you send with him? Uh, what mode of uh, transfer you will uh, provide for the patient? And all of this, you need to determine the risk of deterioration and manage accordingly. Any signs or symptoms or investigation 
that mandate, there is a risk of deterioration. The patient should be addressed properly. And then you prepare for the transport accordingly. Uh, you prepare the medication, you prepare the IV fluid uh, that needs to be given to the patient, IV lines secured and functioning properly, the proper team uh, accompanying the patient, including uh, in some critically ill patient, the intensivist or uh, patient who can deal with the airway and uh, can properly ventilate the patient during the journey, especially if the journey is can take more than two or three hours uh, staying with the patient so you can safely deliver the patient to the hospital. So assessment of the patient condition is very important and stabilization, as we mentioned, the definition of the uh, inter-hospital transfer regarding the <coughs> uh, patient surface, it's very important that you do more good than harm when transferring the patient and is the patient uh, is a patient center. Uh, it is uh, important to notice that sometimes you cannot stabilize the patient because of the patient condition itself. Like if you don't have a, a, a surgeon in the hospital and the patient got uh, RTA and the patient is deteriorating, you will waste time if you are trying to uh, stabilize this patient and time is essence in some uh, condition. So you have to stabilize the patient as much as you can, but do not delay the definitive care for uh, stabilizing the patient only. Uh, that's to say, a patient with ST elevation MI who have a cardiogenic shock and patient is unstable, you will address the risk of sending the patient to other facilities or keeping the patient with you. You will do all measures to stabilize the patient while preparing to transport the patient, but the patient will not be stabilized unless his condition is addressed. Uh, so this is to say you need to weigh what you can provide the patient to get him improved, and what is the benefit he will get if he transport to other area. Uh, <clears throat> you need to, uh, in the assessment, to look for the uh, whether the patient is stable for transfer or not, and you stabilize the patient as uh, much as you can, and you get a check a response uh, for uh, the patient and uh, send for help if the patient like for deteriorating. And uh, as Dr. Abdullah mentioned, you need the help from the ICU or from the intensivist to optimize the patient before sending him to the other hospital. Uh, you start assessment of the airway, uh, your uh, breathing status of the patient, uh, his circulation, assess uh, disability, assess the environment uh, that you are uh, sending the patient uh, in, uh, manage uh, the environment of transfer as much as possible to facilitate the safe transfer. What is the factors that impact the transfer? The most important is acuity of the patient. How ill is the patient and the level of care needed during the transport? Whether you can send the patient with a private vehicles uh, or basic life transport uh, ambulances, uh, or even uh, might need uh, specialty care transport, uh, such as stroke patient or uh, burn patients. <clears throat> and what is the estimated time to get into the definitive care? It's uh, very important. If uh, the patient will get late to the definitive care, uh, the benefit of inter-hospital transfer is not uh, there, and then no need to transfer the patient. Also the health policy, like uh, Directorate of Health uh, in a TAIF uh, recommendation regarding transfer of patient and Ministry of Health as a general and also patient preference. Level equity. We divide the level of equity of patient as in the triage also into five levels. Level one, 
which uh, involve patient with no risk of decline or deterioration. And patient is uh, on routine vital signs. He got IV line uh, in place and he got uh, supplemental oxygen administration. is not uh, expected to deteriorate. While level two is a stable patient uh, with low risk of decline. Uh, this one need active IV infusion. Patient was uh, shocking some uh, cause of his disease and then he on active IV fluid or uh, IV medication. Uh, he needs uh, pulse oximetry monitoring and uh, he needs a personalized care with advanced assessment skills from the doctors. <coughs> While level three include all patients with a stable and moderate risk of decline uh, this patient uh, will uh, have, uh, e, in addition to the level two, uh, ECG uh, telemetry, uh, cardiac and other life-sustaining medication and measures. Uh, level four uh, is a patient is stable, a patient with stable with a high risk of decline. Uh, it includes level three and advanced airway or uh, intubation. My needed for this patient, mechanical ventilation. <coughs> support and uh, management with vasoactive drips. Uh, the last level is unstable patient with clinical deterioration. This kind of patient, in addition to the needs of the others, like advanced airway patient, uh, advanced airway or intubated patient or patient need mechanical support. In addition to that, he, you are unable to achieve a sustained hemodynamic stabilities. Uh, patient actively deteriorating and his clinical picture, ongoing requirement for invasive monitoring or procedures. Time to definitive care. This is also very important uh, impact, uh, have important impact on the patient transfer. At the time patient get injured or get ill, it gets to your hospital. So initial medical care will be started for this patient. Uh, during this assessment, you will uh, have uh, to decide whether this patient care can be provided in your hospital or you need to, uh, you need to transfer the patient to other uh, hospital. And then uh, after you make a decision to transfer, then, uh, your hospital and transport response uh, to the transfer is uh, calculated also, and including the time that the patient is spent at his referring hospital, the time needed for uh, the patient to get stabilized. Uh, uh, the last, uh, the one before is the time to uh, receiving hospital, how long the journey will take from the patient going out of the referring hospital to get to the door of the receiving hospital and the time to definitive care uh, within the receiving institution. From this, you can uh, see the decision to transfer. It should be taken as early as possible because it has impact on the patient, uh, it have the in, impact on the patient, uh, it have the impact on patient uh, final uh, condition improvement and the definitive care for his condition. <clears throat> Don't delay the decision to transfer the patient. Don't delay the decision to transfer the patient if the uh, service cannot be provided in your hospital. This is to say, as we mentioned in the uh, goals and objectives of the interhospital transfer, you have to have a list of condition and diagnosis that is not going to be managed in your hospital. So when this diagnosis is met, when the patient presented to your hospital, decision for transfer is uh, made as soon as possible with pulling all the uh, chain of uh, hospital and transport response time. And <coughs> to minimize the time at referring hospital to get the patient stabilized and improved. 
time to receiving hospital, you choose the nearest, closest hospital who can provide the service for the patient. But you cannot send the patient to a closest hospital, as many studies show uh, doctors or facilities tend to shift the patient to closest uh, facilities. It's not uh, like that. You should send the patient to the area of uh, resources that can help the patient. Uh, time to definitive care also impact have great impact on the patient uh, final uh, clinical improvement. <clears throat> this one also depends on the communication, as we mentioned. The uh, receiving doctors already communicate properly with the uh, treating doctors or the referring doctors, and he knows exactly what uh, what he needs to do for the incoming patient. Uh, lastly, let us discuss the uh, responsibilities of post uh, referring and receiving hospital. What is uh, expected from the referring hospital? Number one, uh, he has to he has to uh, anticipate and prepare for potential needs to transfer. Number one. And then he made the appropriate decision to transfer on a solid clinical background and the services in his facility and in the receiving and the availability of this uh, service in the receiving hospital. He will as much as possible stabilize the patient prior to transfer and prepare for the transport properly with adequate equipment. Uh, and critical intervention should not wait for the transport team. Uh, do not delay transport if work can safely be done elsewhere. Uh, don't uh, delay the transfer of the patient for definitive care because uh, this can be done in the receiving hospital. But uh, important critical intervention that have impact on the patient during the transfer, it should be done. And then you choose appropriate transport process and destination. This is very important also, the receiving hospital capability of caring of your patient you are sending to them. And you have to have a consent of transfer from post family and receiving hospital. So many times we get a patient without proper uh, transfer or consent from post the family or uh, from the receiving hospital. And then what is the receiving hospital responsibilities? It's uh, number one, immediately be available for discussion uh, regarding the condition of the patient and accept the patient if capacity permit. And you have to have a clear, concise and expert recommendation to the referring hospital regarding the uh, care of the patient and continuing care during transport until uh, the patient get to you. And then you prepare your environment and staff to accept this patient because this patient might need the uh, life uh, saving procedures. Uh, also organization of the diagnostic and interventions. Uh, most of the time this is not happen because a patient will land without uh, the patient will land uh, to ER without any proper communication or uh, the staff knows the patient and the communication sometimes made with the uh, specialities that provide the service. And uh, you need to uh, waste a long time until you get the patient to the uh, specialty and the care uh, with the uh, appropriate uh, diagnostic uh, and intervention needed for the patient, which should, be, uh, <clears throat> which should be discussed earlier and prepared for. Uh, ensure seamless transition. Uh, it should be easy uh, to go from this hospital to other hospital without problem. Uh, I can remember one case who transferred from one of the peripheral hospital. The patient gets late uh, around uh, 11.30 at the end of the shift. And when the patient get there, uh, the patient was uh, in cardiac arrest. So everyone starts shooting complaint to others. 
the receiving hospital uh, was mentioning that the patient is died on the way to the hospital and the uh, transport team insisted on that the patient when he get into the hospital the patient was already alive and the uh, end result was uh, a complaint and a lawsuit for uh, the mishap to this patient so you make it as much as possible to be seamless uh, transition and the referring hospital the receiving hospital should communicate with the referring and patient provider for uh, getting the important information and the care they can provide to the patient in the hospital <clears throat> so uh, to wrap up with this uh, first of all you need to know your capability in your center before transferring the patient uh, then you get a solid reason for transfer and then communicate properly with the receiving hospital. Sometimes you might uh, need to uh, get into the operation uh, in the um, health directorate or in the Ministry of Health regarding preferring patient as a life saving. If you did so and the patient then uh, directed to be sent to one hospital, there is no harm you call the hospital that you have a patient who are for life saving and the status of the patient is like so and so and we think this patient might need this service and then the time estimated time of arrival to the facility so they can be prepared even the receiving hospital is not accepting the patient in the first place but this is for the uh, benefit of the patient that the patient is directed to the hospital as the service cannot provide it in the regional hospital uh, thank you uh, for attending this and any question thank you dr Adelman. Thank you, Dr. Abdallah. Thank you, Dr. Abdelmanaim. Thank you for all the participants. Any questions for this lecture, please? Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you, Dr. Abdelmanaim. We're going to receive all your questions. Uh, there's a box, Q and A box. You can type your question uh, in this box, please. We are ready to receive uh, your question, and Dr. Abdullah and Dr. Abdelmanaim are going to answer all the uh, questions and your inquiries you can ask. It's a good time to ask and uh, you can um, ask anything. Dr. Abdullah is here and Dr. Abdelmanam is here. Please type your question. There's a box, Q and A box. You can type your question in there. We are still waiting for your uh, questions. And chat is available now. You can type your question in the uh, chat also. Please don't be hesitate. Write your question and the doctor is gonna answer. You are still waiting. Is someone raising a hand? Tito, okay. Mito. You can type your question, please. Even you can uh, ask directly. You can turn on your mic, please, Tito. Your mic is allowed now. You can turn on your mic and you can ask directly from the mic. Okay. We're still waiting. Okay. Ali. Dr. Ali, is here. Ali yeah. The question, uh, recurrent cardiac arrest every 15 minutes and recovery only for five minutes. Patient need urgent BCI, which is not available in hospital. What is the way for transfer? The answer, Dr. Dr. Abdullah, Dr. Abdul Munaim. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, 
سؤال كاتب انه ريكرنت كارديك ارست افري 15 مينيت اند ريكفري اونلي فور 5 مينيت بيشنت نيد ايرجنت بي سي اي وش نوت وش نوت وش از نوت افيلبل ان ذا هوسبيتال وات از ذا واي فور ترانسفير اوكي فيرست اوف اول از يو منشن فور ذا لايك ذيس بيشنت ويز ان ذا ام اي If there is an ST elevation in my, the guideline said, if you can transfer the patient to PCI capability hospital within less than two hours to perform it. Or if the hospital far away, you have to thrombolize your patient in your spot. And in this situation, like this patient with an MI, ST elevation in my cardiac arrest, you didn't have a PCI in your hospital. I think, and also we have to ask the expertise in the cardiologist, it's, uh, it's indicated to thrombolize the patient in your hospital, stabilize the patient. As you said, he's a post-cardiac arrest. He should be intubated, started in, in vasoconstrictive drugs and cardiac support. And if the patient is stable, that's time he can be transported to another facility. Uh, T2 uh, uh, 1937 sometimes not accepting cases and cases in need of ICU and no ICU in our hospital. Okay, well, uh, uh, the surface of 1937 is for urgent calling and uh, answering your question, helping you to manage the cases and also help you to direct and refer your cases. Even if there is no ICU in your hospital, they will guide you how to uh, transfer the case to the nearest capable facility. And uh, 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 1937, who will answer your call, is a uh, certified doctor specialized. Sometimes uh, the case, it's an, uh, to be difficult to shift or uh, the case to be an, uh, no further treatment to be provided for the patient, so they will ask you to keep the patient in. This is a situation dependent and subject within the cases is being different. Dr. Abdullah, I want to talk about the case that you mentioned, because this case is very important. Yeah, that's and right. Most time, uh, and most of the time, it will end badly. Uh, That's right. This patient is highly unstable. This is yes. the most critical patient you can ever face. And the outcome and the risk of this patient to get uh, to die, to say, to die is very high. Because the patient is getting into cardiac arrest every five minutes. And we know that when the patient goes into cardiac arrest multiple times, the expectation of him getting back uh, to discharge is very low. So this case, you need to weigh the risk of sending the patient to a facility where he can get PCI or not. This is very important. But number one, as we mentioned, stabilization of the patient is of paramount for this case of the patient. Nevertheless, very difficult to stabilize heart because all the effort you do or you did, this patient is still going into cardiac arrest. You need to have a very good thorough discussion with the family and relative because when you are telling them, we are sending this patient to the other hospital, he can get uh, care there, they expect their their relative will survive. They will get hope. I don't uh, say you don't give them hope, but give them the facts that the patient might improve if he get there safely and he get the uh, expected treatment for him. Uh, regarding stabilization, this is one important, very important is the communication with your the patient relative the first of kin of the patient and the guardian of the patient himself regarding the uh, benefit of treatment the risks that can occur during transport 
including the death of the patient, you will tell him clearly in a simple, clear uh, words what expected to be done there and what is the clinical condition of the patient and get their consent based on the fact that the patient might survive or might not uh, in regard to the scenario you given. You need to contact the facility because this patient cannot wait. This patient is not a kind of patient who will go to ER and then stay for ER until papers completed. This patient should go directly from the door of the hospital to the uh, PCI if the PCI is uh, the mode of definitive care for such a patient. Uh, so good communication and getting the cardiologist recommendation is very important. And after you get the recommendation from the cardiologist, you need to go back to the uh, patient relatives and tell them what is the recommendation of the receiving hospital. So they will not get surprised if they went to the hospital. You are sending them to get PCI and there the cardiologist uh, decided there is no use or benefit for uh, PCI for this patient. And then they will get angry at that moment. So you will get back to the uh, family with the recommendation and the uh, opinion of the receiving hospital. You decide to send the patient after acceptance from the cardiologist and the family understand the issue surrounding the patient uh, condition. Stabilization, as I mentioned, is very, very difficult in this patient because of the heart condition. So you will do your best in, as uh, Dr. Abdullah mentioned, you get the patient intubated so he will not have deterioration of uh, his airway during the transport. You can uh, as support the piecing as much as possible. And you will start in eutrophic support for the uh, patient to maintain it. Uh, you need to choose a team who will accompany this patient. And the team should know this patient is going to carry arrest anytime and it can be multiple times. So they get ready for CPR. Okay? You get my point? <laughs> Uh, the second one is regarding the 937. 937 actually will direct patient rejected by hospitals. So if 937 rejected your transfer to ICU, that means you don't need the service, actually. Thank you, Dr. Abdelman. Fee him a peripheral hospital not have a team only one doctor for each hospital, not blame him because we not having an ICU stuff, not like, uh, I, I will tell one thing just, uh, this is an, uh, an uh, outreached hospital, it's a peripheral hospital. So uh, uh, stabilize the case before shifting is the ministry of your, or, or the corner <coughs> to, to your, uh, uh, duty or your, uh, uh, your job in this case, just uh, nobody will blame you if you didn't have an ICU or a critical bed uh, or critical monitoring bed, but they will blame you if the patient being uh, uh, arrested or died during transportation because the hospital itself is considered as an, a safe area for the patient usually and uh, the, the, you, you will shift your patient for, for, for a further treatment. Uh, as we said before, shifting the patient or transfer a patient should to be before, during, and after a safe process. Or ensuring the safety in the hospital for managing and stabilizing the case before shifting, that's the goal. And nobody will ask you to an operate ICU bed when you didn't have a stat, staff, because all of us know ICU is an, uh, is an advanced 
uh, modality of care for the cases. So again, please just try to stabilize the patient as much as you can and make it safe trip for both of our medical professionals, health provider and the patient together. Uh, I saw a question, I'm, I'm, I'm not an, a pediatrician or a neurotherapist, but I think Dr. Uh, Dr. Abdel Manam can maybe help me in this one. I can see the question and also the same question uh, asked by Tito Mito is also uh, repeated again. Actually, 1937 is a safety measures, is a safety net. If the receiving hospital rejected the case and you still uh, think that the patient need the uh, transfer to this facility, you will call this uh, safety net and they have the experience and the, the uh, ability to direct the patient to the receiving hospital in spite of the patient already refused to accept the case so this is your safety net if you lost your safety net that means either one of the two the first one is you did not give the clinical picture clearly for them to give the decision to transfer the patient that's right hundred percent uh -huh. You did not give the uh, clinical picture in a right, proper way. So you need to go back and reassess your patient and give the information in a proper way. This is one. Or your patient does not uh, need ICU based on the information you give to them. If the patient is sent to one uh, receiving hospital and he rejected, maybe he is not accepting the patient for one or another reason. So you go to Ministry of Health and the center patient as a life saving and they are the safety net. They are in your side. So you better give them the proper information so the decision will be based on uh, valid clinical data. Okay. Uh, did I answer this question properly? The second one, the patient is having neutral jaundice uh, and this one does not need uh, did not need the uh, <coughs> ambulance. Actually, this is you give uh, equity level for your case, and based on the equity level, you choose the mode of transportation. This patient might you don't expect them to deteriorate during the transport. So uh, basically, support ambulances can send the patient to the. Uh, pediatric hospital or the pediatric facility for uh, phototherapy. Some more you can start the phototherapy in your facility while preparing for transfer of patient. So uh, it depends on the clinical situation of the patient at the moment you need to transfer him. Uh, if you decide this is not uh, need an ambulance, and patient it can safely be go with the family, you can send him with their private cars. But this one have this advantage that the patient might decide not to go to the hospital, which uh, pose risk on the patient himself. I, you got my point. If the patient, you advise them. Sometimes I advise patient who came to our ER uh, like a patient having convulsion and one convulsion, unknown case of epilepsy, and it is one convulsion. Sometimes we give them the uh, option if they want to go themselves directly to the hospital. But we will tell them that we are obligated to provide a transport for them to the hospital, but for gaining the time and getting to the hospital, they can go and they should approve or uh, consent on this. If you decide at any time that the patient at risk, if you let them go without proper arrangement, don't send uh, with the family. You do the proper unless they refuse the service themselves. As I mentioned, you choose the mode of transportation according to the patient clinical situation. Thank you. We are still waiting for the questions. 
Dr. Abdullah, we, one question for BDI patient. Uh, what age definition for acceptance in BICO as BDI hospital I refuse it if patient above uh, 12 years? Okay. So uh, in our Ministry of Health, that's the, as you mentioned, it's an, uh, uh, more than 12 years or 13 years and above should to be in the adult hospital except in some special situation that's been agree, agreed before, like if you need a uh, pediatric surgeon or if you need an, uh, special measures like in a special metabolic support, special metabolic diseases, DKA sometime until age of 14. Uh, I think if the uh, pediatric hospital rejected your case as a, a PICU need in that time and you assess your patient well and you see the patient is needing ICU, you can contact 1937 and seek the expertise uh, advice and might to help to redirect your case. Uh, another thing uh, I have to mention it here. Uh, I know that's the pressure of the job. I know when you are in a outreach hospital, the patient crashed, the family around you, or the attending of the patient. Uh, I know the stress, the situation, but please, when you write in a medical report for a case, make it clear and uh, medical report for shifting or for transportation or for accepting the case, it's like a message. Try to make it clear. Try to make uh, everything or all the information easy to be understood or understand by the uh, reader or the receiver for the uh, transfer. If uh, some of the referral, I saw it, by myself, uh, uh, 42 years, as example, 42 years old, stable. Uh, then I found uh, comatose, his UCS is seven, he's been intubated. But in the beginning, they wrote unstable. Uh, sometime I found another transfer, once a uh, patient like, I'll give you an example, one of the thing I saw it, uh, 50 years old, COVID positive patient, uh, stable for isolation, uh, patient on a 15 liter oxygen saturation, 85, uh, rebreathing, uh, rebreathing uh, mask, uh, 15 liters with a saturation, 88. So uh, when you read like this, it's, it, it seems to be that there is a conflict on the refer itself or referral form. So please try to make it clear, easy. Uh, I think also one of the things can solve all of this issue when you send the referral, try to contact the hospital. We have a network also on the connection of the Thai Health Affair. You can contact the hospitals and ask them why my patient be rejected, what I can do, it's okay for contacting the hospital. Like you will, you will, you will refer a case to one hospital. You can contact the technical director there through your technical director in the hospital. Thank you a lot. Peace uh, uh, Okay, thank you. What are the indication of mid evac mode of transportation and the criteria for that? Okay, mid evac. It's an uh, medevac. It's one of the advanced. It's an um, uh, usually being uh, directed through the uh, headquarter of the region and uh, for special cases. And you know, it's uh, like for the life saving case, and also they need it in advanced cases, because especially in the organ support. Uh, I think the surface should to be arranged well because uh, contacting the, the responsible people during that time when you saw the patient for shifting and he's not fit to be shifted through ambulance or what they call it an ground shifting. Uh, and uh, he's, he's legible for air shifting. 
might to be contacting them and to help to shift the patient. Any more questions? <coughs> We're waiting for your questions. Okay, thank you very much. طيب نهاية الموضوع اليوم نشكر نشكر الدكتور عبد الله الحارثي والدكتور عبد المنعم شكرا عبد المنعم شاركي نشكر الاستاذ طارق العافية يعطيكم العافية نشكر جميع الحضور ان شاء الله تكون الفائده للجميع وان شاء الله حتنزل طبعا ان شاء الله حتنزلوها على الموقع حتكون متاحه بعدين للناس ان شاء الله ان شاء الله الدوره هذه حتكون متاحه غدا ان شاء الله صباح في موقعنا منصة إرادة وأرجو من الحضور اليوم اللي حضروا يرجعوا لمنصة إرادة غدا إن شاء الله ويضيفوا الدورة في السلة وينتظروا 12 ساعة الناس اللي دخلوا زملائنا اليوم مجرد إنك أنت حتخش السيستم حيتعرف إنك أنت حضرت الدورة لأنه حرفق الملف اللي جاني أنا من ملف الأسماء من خلال إيميلاتكم وحتصدروا شهاداتكم الحضور إن شاء الله من الموقع غدا الصباح بإذن الرحمن شكرا لكم وإن شاء الله ألتقيكم في دورات أخرى في أمان الله الله يعطيكم العافية شكرا لجميع بارك الله فيكم في أمان الله